we started off with planning. Just to show you how important it was to start your year with a plan. You've got to have a plan. God's a God of planning. God plans. He planned our salvation before the foundation of the earth. And God knows the plans that he has for you. God's a planner. And a lot of Christians and believers don't understand that if you want God to move in your life, then you've got to come to him with a plan. Come to him with something. Don't ask God to do everything for you. God wants us to grow up spiritually, grow up into maturity, grow up into the fullness of Christ, it says in Ephesians chapter 4. And in doing so, God wants us to come up with plans. I know sometimes they may fail in the sense that they might be, you know, not exactly what God wants. But if in all your ways you acknowledge him, he'll direct your plans, your steps. So it's very, very important that you understand planning. But here's why. Because there are two things that you have no control of in the sense that you can't stop them. You cannot stop time and you cannot stop change. You can't. We're all getting the same 24 hours and we're all changing in life, whether that be just changing of seasons or changing in our physiology or changing in our maturity or development or our experience. We change. Change is built into is built into creation so you can't stop it but if you don't do something about time and change it'll just pass you by so it's imperative that you and i understand that the only way to take advantage of time and the only way to take advantage of change is to plan and that's what a plan does a plan helps you harness time in other words it doesn't pass you by with with no intent or no no reasoning it just doesn't pass you by so uh, uh, plans harness time and if you put a plan together you can actually not just watch change happen but you can actually initiate change create change yourself it is changing but you can have influence on that change as it happens instead of just watching it happen so we took that whole series up at the beginning and then we we, we connected that into the next series which was vision and we talked about how that there's sight and vision. Sight is what you have for the human physiology, for your eyes. Sight allows you to see what was and what is. It's a physical thing. You can only see what was and you can only see what is. And everything that is physical on the earth with eyes, see. But just because you have eyes to see doesn't mean you have vision. Vision is a spiritual force. Vision is something that the human spirit has been hardwired with. An imagination, the ability to dream, the ability to see and hope for what isn't as yet existing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We have an ability to see. Paul says, I look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen, he says in Corinthians. We can see what isn't yet. He says, well, how can you do that? It's this spiritual force that is within the human spirit called vision. And it's so essential because vision is what gives substance or reasoning, shall I say, to plan. And so when you catch a vision for something that isn't yet, then in order to make it happen, you've got to plan. And so we talk up that whole aspect of vision. Vision sees the future. Uh, sight sees what was and what is. If you're going to live by sight, you're limited. If you're going to live by sight, you're stuck in what was and what is. But if you're going to live by vision, you can break the mold of what was and what is and you can take your life to where it has never been before. All the breakthroughs in humanity, all the advancement in the human uh, uh, society have come from people, whether they realize it or not, who tapped into that hardwiring called vision and made things and created things and achieved things and fixed things and invented things they were once just vision, and they advanced humanity as a result of it. So it's a very powerful thing. But you, you, you don't just happen to accidentally come upon it. You can actually exercise it. And we talked about that in that series. And then we came to this one, purpose. And the reason the other two exist, the reason for vision and the reason for planning, is because of this thing, purpose. Purpose is the reason you exist. Purpose is the reason that... Um, that uh, that God um, put you in this generation. A lot of times people come into this world looking for a purpose. And I said, you know, stop looking for one. You are a purpose. Your life is purpose. Your, your life is attached to purpose. The Bible says to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose. Everything. When, when you say everything, it means everything created. 
in the Bible says in Genesis 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the air so if it's created it has purpose we talked about how there's not a thing in this room there's not a thing that exists that doesn't have a functionality or a purpose to it so the very fact that something exists is evidence that it has a purpose the thing about you and I is we spend most of our lives trying to discover that purpose. Many people never, never realize that they have one. Some people think that there is no purpose for the life. And they think life's not worth living eventually. And, and some people exit early because they just felt there was no purpose for them. And that's not true. There's a purpose for every person. God is a God of purpose. And so we took all that up and we said, look, it, if there's a purpose for something, well then within that individual within that creation within that is design so we said every purpose determines function and function sets the design that includes the potency or the power or the potential or the gifts and the graces that is that is your nature sometimes you say well that just comes natural to them well yeah you, you can say that because that was put in their potency that was put in their gifts and their graces that God gives them. Why? Because God had a design for that individual. So some people are designed to do things that others aren't. That's what makes us different. But, but we, we, we have talents and graces and gifts based on design, and that design is because of the function God has for our life. And that function is the outworking of God's purpose and the reason he gave us life. And so, you know, I said, you don't live life as an experiment. You live life as an assignment. And we've got to understand that. There's a purpose for my life. And it takes time to discover it many times. But you know what? To know that there is one and to pursue it is a great thing. It, it should be the quest of your life. Uh, you know, as, as the psalmist said, or as Paul said, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. I haven't right. He said, I want to get a hold of what got a hold of me. I haven't got there yet, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, I press for that reason, to hit that mark and fulfill that function and design and use those gifts and graces for the very intent that God give me life. So, we talked about how that as you outwork purpose, you may not have a, a definitive but we said that your gifts and graces do coincide with your functionality. They do coincide with your design and your potential. So many times when you're looking for your purpose, you say, I wonder what God wants me to be or what God wants me to do. And you know what? Look at what you do naturally. Because what is natural to you is a good indication and, and coincides with the very purpose God has for your life. It's just, it's just being able to nail that down. And here's the reason for nailing it down. When you can discover, when you come to the reality and the understanding of the purpose of your life and God being in your life and, and you having the, 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 um, the, the favor of God to head in, a, in an arena or in a direction, it brings so much confidence and peace and boldness and, and authority. I mean, it's amazing when you know God is with you in it. You don't have to prove anything to anybody then. You just have to outwork your vision or the purpose for which you exist. And you don't find your um, acceptance in what people say. You find your acceptance in fulfilling what God asked you to do. And so it really frees you up. It gives you a lot of confidence and boldness and happiness and peacefulness and joy. And there's a lot of things go with knowing your purpose, really. And we talked about that, I think, last week or maybe the week before. As you go through life, and, and, and as we dither in and out of different things through life, we often ask the question, is this my purpose, or is this my purpose, or is that? But here's the deal. If you commit your ways to God, God will direct your path. If you commit your plans to God, God will help bring ultimately his purpose to, plan, to, to pass. And, and so, you know, we, we may try different things, and, and, and sometimes God brings us on journeys. And the purpose of the journey is to give us the experiences that are necessary to develop, to hone the talents or the gifts or the graces that we have so that we can fulfill our purpose. Sometimes we've got to learn some character. Sometimes we've got to learn some skill sets. Sometimes we've got to take our attributes and educate them a little bit better. We've got to advance our skill sets in some arenas. 
Sometimes we've got to learn to live with different types of people in order to be able to fulfill the purpose of our life. And so we find ourselves on a journey sometimes and you think, God, what am I doing here? But if you'd stop being frustrated about, God, what am I doing here? And saying, God, thank you that my steps are ordered of the Lord. And whatever it is I've got to learn while I'm here, show me what I've got to learn. Show me what I've got to develop. Show me what I've got to be. And it's amazing what you learn and pick up and what you will mature into and develop that will enable and empower you to carry on. And when you've learned your lesson at that particular turn or junction in life, God will move you on. And so life is a journey. And sometimes we don't, we don't know the journey for sure, but we do know the purpose. And so we, we work our way through life's journey with the endeavor to fulfill the purpose of life. I said this too. Don't ask a thing its purpose. You ask the creator of the thing its purpose. So I don't get my purpose from you. You don't get your purpose from me. We get our purpose from the one who made us. And that's why I've often said that if you, you'll never know yourself till you know God. Because when you meet God, God will give you your purpose if you will seek it. Everybody with me so far? I'm just trying to recap everything, summarize it all so I can tie it up in a ribbon and a bow and, <laughs> and let it go. All right. We talked about this. Plans may change. You may get on the hobby horse of life. You may get a job here, and of course, they'll put you on the merry-go-round of, you know, living in a company or a corporation or a certain skill set, or you may work with your degree, and everybody will say this is what you're supposed to be. If you want to live here, buy that, drive this, wear that. I mean, that's what you got to do. And so in life, you jump up on the hobby horses of life or the job or the employments of life, and you know what? It's not that they're wrong. And they may not be the ultimate purpose of your life, but they do develop the skill sets and the character attributes uh, that you need to hone your talents for purpose. So we, we understand that that's the way life is. But let me tell you this, the plans or the jobs may change, but the purpose in your life is permanent. So you may find yourself in a job right now and say, well, I hate the place I'm in. You know what? And it may be an awful place to work, but you know what? If you can develop the nature, the character, the attributes, skill sets, and hone what it is you need to hone to make you more mature and better and skillful, well, when you pass it and when you're ready, God will move you on from there because that doesn't define you. And so plans may change. So I, I'm planning to do what God wants me to do. Hey, here's a door open. I'm going to step into that. I think that's the will of God for my life. It may well be the will of God for your life. And you get in there and think, God, what am I doing in here? I hate it. I thought it was your will for my life. Well, it was his will for your life. But watch, because there's things to learn while you're there. If you learn and go through the things you need to go through, you know, God, God's got to develop. You've got to grow somewhere. You know, the Bible says this. If somebody wants to turn to Hebrews chapter 5, just for a moment, Hebrews chapter 5. Jesus, um, you know, he's, he was God in flesh. Now, he had to do it as a man in order to qualify and redeem man, life for life. He had to undo what Adam did, and he had to do it as Adam did it. So he had to live a life by faith, believe in the word of God and trust in God for everything. Even his death, burial, and resurrection, he had to have faith in God for that. And believed that the outcome would be what the scripture said. Um, but in Hebrews chapter 5, does somebody want to read verse 5, I think it is, 5 and 6? If you start it, I'll be able to. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I gotten thee. As he shall also in another place. Thou art a priest forever after the order of the Yeah. Um, now, I think, I, I, think I, I, I fired you down the lane too much there. Um, is that Hebrews 5? Yeah. I, no, no, Hebrews 5 is right. I just, I, I wanted to bring it, 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 it in more. And if you go back to, what did you read for me there, 5 and 6? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I, I wanted you to move on, keep, keep going if you would. Keep going. Though he were a son, yet learned he, he obedience by the things which he suffered. 
Say that again. Though he were. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. How did God how did Jesus learn obedience? How did Jesus learn obedience? Now, it wasn't suffering in that he was, it was that he was picked on, he was accused, he was ridiculed, he was uh, unpopular or popular, he was up, he was down, they were cheering him on, then they were, you know, he went through all sorts of things in life, just, as a, just by living life. He suffered things in life. You say, well, you know, what did he do from 12 to, eight, uh, 12 to 30 years? When he was 12, what did he do? Because he knew we knew it was about his father's business. He said that when he was 12. So what did he do for the next 18 years, up until he was 30 years of age and comes back on the scene again? Well, he worked, and he worked in Sapporah, probably that city just down the street from Bethlehem, or Nazareth, shall I say. And he worked there as a builder with his stepdad. And he learned a lot of things. He learned culture. He learned... A, a obedience to his parents and submission he learned all of those things and 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 that he didn't just come up and say well i'm god in flesh i know all these things no 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 he had to hone his character and hone his attributes and his skill sets and his compassion and his mercy and his understanding for the culture and the people around him through the things that he went through in life and god ordained that life for him and he committed that to god and when the time was ready God then used him. So what happened for the first 30 years? He was being prepared for what it was that he would ultimately fulfill and finish. And likewise, we find ourselves maybe in positions or jobs or, or, or a, you know, at, at different capacities of life, whether we be at home with our babies or whether we you know, are at school educating ourselves to try and, and, and develop some skill set that we have or some natural inquisitiveness that we have that is really part of our makeup for for future and we might find ourselves thinking well am i in the will of god here i mean i'm at university or um, i'm a, I'm a stay-at-home mom raising these kids or I, i'm i'm working you know at a job but it's not the best job in the world I, I think i could do better all of that is part of the development of your life every experience that you go through and so plans may change but the purpose of your life is permanent. The Bible says in, um, somebody go to, um, uh, go to uh, Romans chapter two, please, in verse 29. Romans chapter two. Uh, yeah, just go to Romans because it just talks about God being no respecter of uh, of persons. Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm picking the right. verse eleven. I'm sorry. Romans chapter two, verse eleven. For there is no partiality with God. All right, there's no respecter of persons. God's not treating us differently. He loves us all the same, and God doesn't have preferences over people. And if you see somebody getting on with God more than others, it's because of faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God for them to come to him must believe that he is and the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if you see people moving down the street further with God, advancing more with God, quicker with God than others, don't think that God is partially, has shown partiality to one over another. He's not. He treats everybody the same. But here's something else that you need to understand with that in mind. Go to Romans chapter 11, if you would, and somebody read verse 29. Romans 11 and verse 29. Excuse me. God's gifts and his call for your life, the purpose for your life is irrevocable. Now you may have a gift and a talent and you may abuse it. You may have a gift and a talent to do something that God asked you to do, skilled you to be, but you never really found out what the purpose was. In fact, you might not have even found God in your life. You may not have yielded to God in your life. You may have just rejected it and said, well, I'm not into it. And yet God's still not going to take that gift from you, that ability from you, that skill set from you, because he gave it to you for a purpose and his purpose for you was good. But if you never press into it, if you never find God, if you reject God's intent for your life, God's not going to re revoke that grace or that talent from you. However, 
you would probably find that it would function much better if you had yielded it to God, if you had found out that it was a God thing and allowed God by his word and spirit help you to accomplish the goal. And a lot of times people miss the goal of their life because they just never tap into God's purpose. They never find out it was God. And unfortunately, sometimes they exit early in life. And But here's the deal. God will never revoke his purpose for your life. It stays with you. So there's many a person sitting under a bridge tonight. There's many a person in a bad place tonight, maybe. And they're just out of the will of God. And they'll miss the purpose of God for their life. They'll just miss it. And that's sad because they've got, they've got purpose. God give, the fact that they exist means God had a plan for them. And then there are others in high and mightier places, behind locked and, and secure gates and whatever, and they're just as lost. And they may seem as, as successful as far as you know, the acquisition of things in life, but they, they didn't hit the mark either. They missed the purpose of God for their life. And, and they, they, they both fail. And so you know, it's all about finding that purpose. And you can if you'll seek it. So I put this diagram up last week. And I put these five things. Purpose, vision, destiny, plan, and more. Or work. All right? And here's what we said about purpose. Purpose is God's plan for your life. The reason you exist. And it's that red line on this little diagram I have here. Then you'll see along with that purpose, because it goes from start to finish, that is your purpose. Then I put vision, and I wrote vi vision is the incremental, piecemeal, achievable dreams given in order to fulfill purpose. As you go through purpose, God gives you these visions. And, and they're not a way down here. You take a way down here, oh, I, I, I'd never be like that. But if he gives you piecemeal, sizable, achievable vision, you can live with that. You can, you can press for those visions. Many times when that vision is achieved and accomplished and you're used to it, then all of a sudden, you know, you get familiar with it. And as you go down here to this low, familiar, I'm confident, I wish there was something more exciting to do, normally we get vision again. And he gives us another vision. And with that vision, this, we plan and we, we come back onto the the road and we start a vision again and we work it through until and so our life is a series of of visions the blue line that we have there on that uh, diagram is destiny which what i was trying to explain to you earlier destiny is pre-arranged god knows where, where we're going pre-arranged relational connections sometimes you meet people you say well it's serendipity it's not it's god arranging connections in your life to get you where you need to be Prearranged relational connections, advanced situational experiences that develop the character, the attributes that empower and enable the fulfillment of purpose. That happens through your family, it happens through education and marriage and career and work and different responsibilities and circumstances. They're all part of that. And so you can see that blue line is all over the place. Because sometimes we, we, we're actually on the direction. We're going somewhere. We may not realize it. Purpose is where we're heading. Vision is what we're doing. But you know what? We meet. We get a job here. Go there. Visit this. Meet her. Meet him. Have kids. Na, 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 na. And we go through our journey. And the whole part is called destiny. Or the journey to our destination. And God orchestrates that if you let him. All with me? And then interwoven into that is plans, that green line. When you get a vision, then you plan again. That's when the plan comes in. And the plan helps you, again here, to create priorities, to determine decisions, to dictate companions, and predict choices. Once you make a plan, these things start to line up. You start to choose the people you hang with. You start to, because you, you want to achieve and do. You've got to get around the right people, put yourself in the right environment. And then finally, work is what we're going to talk about tonight. And that is activated strength and energy and the use of the abilities and the faculties to release the potential. Work, again, is this purple line. And all of this, whether it be vision or destiny or plans, you've got to work at that along with your purpose, to get all of that out. You can't just sit on your laurels and think, God, you know, you planned for me to be 
a great man or a great woman of God in this arena to achieve this or to accomplish that. And sit on your hands and say, God, whenever you're ready, I'll do it. <laughs> you're wrong. It's not the way it works. You've got to get out and work at it and work and work in a direction. Take your life out there into society, into the marketplace, into reality, and let God then orchestrate your efforts. But you've got to put the effort in to make this happen. You've got to show up for the battle. People say, you know, God fights my battles. Well, he doesn't, but nonetheless. Um, God fights my battles. Um, and, and, uh, but here's the deal. You know, we always go back to the book of Chronicles where Jehoshaphat said, the prophecy came, for the battle is not yours, says the Lord, but the battle is mine. Well, that was all right in the Old Testament, but we already have a victory now in Jesus. And, and we're not trying to get God to fight our battles. God give us the victory. We fight our own battles in the name of Jesus and by the word of God, under the encouragement of the Holy Ghost, and we win. We fight from victory now, not for victory. All with me? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, and so, um, you know, we all talk about, you know, Jehoshaphat or, um, you, you know, you, 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 I understand what you say when you say, you know, God fights our battles. But here's the deal. You've you got to show up for it. You know, when David fought Goliath, you know, the stone didn't go on its own. Somebody had to show up and do it. When Jehoshaphat, when God said, you know, the battle's not yours, it's mine, the Bible says the next morning he sent his praisers out first. But he had to show up for the battle. You still have to show up. You still have to go out and, and exercise faith. And that's what's necessary. So I put this little diagram and I just put it there so you'd understand what's happening. Everybody with me? All right, let me move on. I added this tonight as we press in here. Whatever God calls for, he provides. Whatever God demands from you, he supplies. Whatever God expects from you, he injects in you, into you. Whatever God assigns of your life, he designs it into you. Whatever God calls out is something that he puts in. Does that make sense? God is not going to ask or call or demand or expect or assign anything from you that he hasn't already designed and functionalities and, and all of that stuff is already there. It's already there. Whatever you are meant to become is already where? It's inside you. Your future is not ahead of you. Your future is where? It's in you. It's in you. It's there. Sometimes we're looking for God to do something and you're looking externally of yourself and the truth is it's not external of you. It's internal in you. You just got to understand we spend so much time externally trying to get God to drag us along purpose, drag us along the, the line of vision and plan and whatever. And the truth of it is, God's not going to do that. God wants us to come up with. God wants us to seek it. God wants us to put the effort in. God wants us to learn the lessons and the experiences as we journey through life. And they may be hard times, and, but there's nothing God will let you go through without providing for you a way to get through it. He just does. He's not putting you in territory that you cannot pr prevail in. But you've got to learn what you've got to learn when you're there. That's all it is. Everybody with me? So, wherever you are right now, and whatever stage of your destiny and that journey, that blue line you are on, whatever vision you are, are operating in or in between, Maybe you've achieved some goals. Maybe you've accomplished some things. Wherever you are on that journey, wherever you are in vision, or right now if you're making plans now, or looking to make plans to get you to the next level of your aspiration, or your desire, or for fulfillment, or for you know the challenge of doing something different, doing something new, and achieving something this year that you didn't do before. Wherever you are, 
in the work process of, of doing that, like tonight, presenting yourselves for the renewing of your mind, presenting yourselves to find the will of God for your life by putting the information and the knowledge in that you might gain some understanding. Whatever that work is in your life, let me tell you, don't be disappointed at where you're at. Because the fact that you're still sucking oxygen and the fact that you're still here is evidence that there's still more to do. There's still more to do. So you think, well, you know, I've done this, you know, I don't know what to do next. Well, hey, you're here. That's where you're at. You may be down there at, at, at that little X down there, but you're there. So well, I wish I knew what to do. Great place to be. That's where you are down there. Start talking to God about it again. And, and you say, well, I work here. And but hey, let's get the vision. Let, let's get a plan. And then watch what God does as he orders your destiny and steps to bring you along that journey. Don't be at all disappointed. So I, I've said this, you know, sometimes we sit on our, on our laurels of what we've achieved and think, hey, we've done great things. You know, a little rocking horse. You know, brilliant. I've hit the mark. I'm the best at what I do. But I, you know, I'm not happy. I wish there was more. Well, there is more. There's a lot more to do. And that more in you is called potential. Potency. Undiscovered power. And it's there. And I've been on that little rocking horse on many stages in my life. Both Lucy and I. We, we've, we've gone through life, achieved some things, broke through some barriers, you know, changed some psyche, changed some thinking, and challenged some things of the status quo. And we, we, we fought some battles and we lost some and won, won, won more than we lost. And, uh, 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 any losses were only to develop us and any losses only made us more determined that's all it was and and so we developed and honed our skill sets and our giftings and our graces and our passion and compassion and our mercy and vision and maturity and growth and 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 we done some things and we sat on our little rocking horse and thought praise god this is great only after a while you got fed up of sitting on the little horse going praise god this is great i'm not happy there's more and God said, great, I'm glad. But we've learned a lot of things to get to this stage. I've got more for you. And, and, and then you just you say, okay, let's go. And you do more. And the fact that you're, you're at that, that place where you want to do more, the fact that you're here looking to know more, the fact that you have aspirations to understand more is evidence that there is more for you to do. And that's called potential. And there's only one way of getting that out of us. Right? Only one way of doing it. So, this is the only way I can describe it. Well, not the only way. It's just, I thought it was the best way to describe it. Purpose is God's easel that he brings out, which is you. He's got an intent for you. And then he puts up that canvas, which is you. And that canvas has within it purpose, of course, because it's sitting on the easel. But there's a vision within it. That vision then, in order for it to happen, needs planning. So you get the, uh, the paintings and the brushes and all of this, what, what needs to be on that canvas, started way back here with God. And, and it's there now in you, in purpose and vision. And, and now you need to work on that and you, and you need to start planning to get this with what God wants and what you're dreaming you can be. You have to start planning that. And, and the getting that out is called work. Work. It's not enough to say God has a plan. It's not enough to say I have a vision. It's not enough to say I have a plan. You still have to work. You got to get up in the morning and do something about it. You got to show up on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night or a Saturday morning or a church on a Sunday. You got to get involved. You got to do something to exercise the gift that is in you, and that's called work. Okay? You got to work. You got to do something. Now, when I mention work, people say, oh, you know, the, the ideal scenario in life, the ideal joy of life is to what? Huh? Relax. Relax. I don't have to work. This is great. Retire. I have nothing to do. That is not the will of God for your life. That, that, that's, a, that's a wrong mindset. That's, that, you, that's not understanding purpose. 
And it's, it's mixing up the two aspirations of work and a job. You can retire from a job, but you can't retire from your work. They're different things. Don't mix them up. The Bible doesn't. Potential must be exercised to be realized. It's not enough to say that you have potential. You never see that potential until you give it something to do. When somebody comes along and says, well, I've got a new idea. Brilliant. I, I, there's something I, I've never done before. Brilliant. You know what? I was sort of hoping. I mean, I've never. Brilliant. I have a dream. Brilliant. I have a plan. This is great. Why? Because these are the elements that give you the opportunity to exercise the potential that is on the inside of you. Now, please understand, anything you've done up to now is no longer potential. It was potential un until you did it. Then after you did it, it wasn't potential because we all saw it. Potential is something that is there, but we can't see it yet. So you have the potential to be, the potential to do, the potential to achieve, the abilities and graces, but we didn't see it yet. Potential. Yeah, you know, when we, when we see the, 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 the loss of a young life, it, it's so sad when it happens. We all grieve over it. Every human being does. Because what you've done is you've robbed us from seeing the potential of that life. Whether it be an infant or whether it be a child or a youth. And the younger they are, the, the more tragic it is. Because we never got to see what God intended for them to be. We never got to see the potential. They never got the chance. And so when it happens, we, we, it's, we call it tragedy. It's tragic. But when you hear of somebody living to 103 or 99 or something, and, and they pass from this life, we say, oh, they're good, our linens. They had a good life. They did well. They hung on a long time. They did better than most. And although for those who love them, it's sad that they depart, there's also the satisfaction of knowing that they had 103 years to exercise their potential, whatever that may have been whether they took it or not. What we really grieve many times, especially in, in, the, in, in the passing of, of youth and infancy, is never getting to see the potential. We understand that that was potential undiscovered. It's a very important thing. The definition of potential. Dormant ability. That means it's there. It just hasn't done anything yet. It just hasn't been given the task yet. It's there. And I'll tell you how I know it's there. Because you're sitting here. That's why. That's how I know it's there. Because you're looking to know more. You're looking to understand. You're looking to find out what God's purpose is for your life. That's how I know. And so it's there. It's dormant ability. It's reserved power. It's untapped strength. It is unused success. It is hidden talents. It is capped capabilities. You know, it's amazing what's on the inside of you, and you don't know it's there until you get a challenge. You know, I, I haven't been to Bible school. I would love to have gone. If we hadn't been able to do it, Lucy and I would have done it. But at that time in life and where we were at, we just hadn't the, hadn't the resources or abilities to do it. But it didn't stop us from achieving the goal of our life and the purpose of our life. It didn't stop us from studying and seeking God. It didn't, because you can do that anywhere. It made us hunt and desperate for, for knowledge from anywhere we could get it. We took anything we could find and used it and utilized it and cultured it and developed it and, and personalized it through revelation over time. Made it ours. But we, we went after it. We're still after. We're here in, in, in Alpharetta because we're still in the pursuit. 
we got off the little the last one we were on because we want to do more we know we can do more we know there's more to do and, and so it just needs a challenge is all that it needs and the potential that is in you right now is dormant ability it is reserved power you've been hanging on to it for for the next stage it's untapped strength you didn't tap into it yet unused success hidden talent and capped capabilities I didn't realize what I was able to do I didn't realize if you had told me this you know decades ago I, I probably would have said absolutely not no way I wanted I was going in a different direction before I met Christ I was planning to be something else before I met God but when I met God he got a hold of me and, and I changed all of that I, I started going in his direction because that's what I wanted for my life I'm still on that journey we all are and the fact that I'm still here is because there is within me capabilities that I, do, I don't realize I have and I'm, I'm discovering them I've told somebody recently my, my level of, of revelation and understanding has just gone through the roof since I uh, since I set foot in this place and it's not because I didn't know it when I was when I was at home in Ireland I knew all the information but the understanding just it, it, it just keeps bubbling up and I think, oh my goodness that's what that means that's what that goes now I now I get it and it's like sort of I, I was on that little you know achievement and, and there was more and when I stepped out to do more it was like God said okay now let me show you more let me equip you for where you're going let me show you what's next and you know what I don't know that I would understand things or have the optic of things the way I have today if I if I was still where I was I'm not knocking where I was it was part of my journey but where I'm at is still part of my journey today does that make sense so it's just amazing what you what what you discover about yourself if you walk with God okay let me get to this everything that is was first inside God do you realize that everything that you can see the universe that it was all inside God so how did God get out what was on the inside of him work all right now here's where here's where we're going watch Genesis 2 1 so God created so sorry so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed on the seventh day God had finished his work Maybe you know God works. He says, that's a job. No, it's not a job. Don't mix them up. It's work. He finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. For God to get out of him what was in him required work work is a spiritual force that enables you to get out of you the purpose the dreams the hopes the vision that is in you you have to work to get it out it's there but it requires labor it requires a work to discover it and so the Bible said God worked so God doesn't need to work God's omnipotent and omnipotent all-powerful he is but in order to get that potency potential out of him all potency all-powerful the only way to get that out was work now we know this from Genesis chapter 2 because you know we, we talk about the laws of first mention when something is mentioned for the first time it sets the precedent for it throughout scripture so when you see it mentioned that's the way it is throughout the Word of God It's the way it's re referred to in the Word of God it's what's a, a, a attained to by the intent of the of the of the word in scripture from there on in and what I want you to see that work is not a curse work is not a burden work is a spiritual ability 
to get your potential out. It's a labor, but it has an intent. So the Bible says God worked and got out of him what we see today. But this was all inside of God, but God worked to get it out. I put down here, a little word down here, ergon is the Greek word in the Septuagint for this word, uh, work. And again, it means to work, to labor, or to produce. God produced the heavens. God, God labored to bring forth what we see today. God worked to produce what we call the universe today. It was in God, but it required work to get it out. And it took him six days to do that. Every day was intentional. Every day was purpose-filled. Every day had plans connected to it, design connected to it. And every day was a job of that, the destiny of that time period to produce all of that. Whether that was in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 3, where he restores it again in a six-day period. I don't know how long Genesis 1-1 was. But I do know this, that if he recreated the earth uh, in Genesis 1-3, and God said, light be, and light was, and the Spirit of God moved and brooded upon the waters of the earth, and so on and so forth, and, and we see six days for him to set it up and re-establish it, that I don't know how long it took him to, to design this, the, the nebula and the stars and the planets and all the stuff that's out there, which we know nothing of. But he's a God of order. He's a God of plan and purpose. So there's nothing out there that exists that was just a fling it out thing. It was, it was so intentional, so purposely made, that God put a name on every star. You know that, don't you? He named every single star. You say, but there's billions upon trillions of billions of galaxies. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Isaiah, God named every single, every single star, every single planet. He says, why would he name it? Because there's a purpose for every one of them. We have no idea that God's potential is awesome. So, he worked. And so what you see there, that's the latest photograph from the Webb telescope, which blows the Hubble telescope out of the water because of its detail. It's incredible. And that's just a square foot in one direction. And they're all galaxies. And those galaxies are filled with billions and trillions of stars, which have billions and trillions of planets and solar systems and everything revolving around them, just like our Earth does around our star of the sun. It's phenomenal. It's mind-blowing. But we're made like this. We're hardwired to think and dream and, and, and we're hardwired like that. He made us in his image and after his likeness. Oh, we're on a very small scale. We're not God, but we do have those, that God hardwiring in our makeup. We're made in his image and after his likeness. So he goes on to say, this was in verse chapter two and verse one, two, and three. Verse four says, these are the generations of the heavens of the earth and when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, and the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. The word there, till, comes from the very same word that we see here, ergon, just, a, it's a, just another aspect of the very same word, and it just means to work, to labor, to do work and to cause to exist or to produce. We call it cultivate or culture. But really what it means is, and the, and the design of it is, to take what is, whereas God made what is. He now gave us the ability to take what is and be creative with it. Whereas God created everything because he's there, that's God, but he made us in his image and after his likeness, and so he now gave us everything that he made and said, now I want you, like me, to cultivate it now. You create with what I've given you. 
That's why he called Adam and said, name every animal. And they became what he called them. They didn't become what God called them. They became what Adam called them. And so, and this is, and this, God said, I, I didn't do anything because I didn't have somebody to work the stuff, to start creating it with it. But when he decided to put man in here, that's when everything took off. Verse 5. Here's another version, the message. It says, At that time God made the earth and the heavens before any grasses or shrubs had sprouted from the ground. God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth, nor was there anyone around to work the ground. Same word that we use for God. To take and create with it, to design, to develop, to plan. Now I know it was already done, it was already there. We didn't make it happen, but he gave us what he had and told us to work with that. Or the uh, uh, English Standard Version says, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. So he said, we're not going to do anything until we find somebody that knows how to use this stuff and start creating with it. And the word to do that is to work. All right? Genesis 2.15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, and again, we're using the same word here, to dress it and to keep it. Or again, the message says, and God took the man, set him down in the Garden of Eden, to work the ground and to keep it in order. Or the ESV again, and the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So the whole purpose of put man in there was to do what he done, which was to take what was inside of him and be creative with what he had. To nurture it, put, grab the potential in it and make something from it. Dream things to do with it. Create things with it. Develop things with it. That was all put in man. And that's what we do. And that's why we do what we do. Let me just run through these. Work is of spiritual origin. Do you know where I got that from? Why can I say that? Sure, but, but, pardon? That's exactly why I said that. Uh, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual origin. Work is not a natural thing, although it has a natural outworking. It's actually a spiritual force in us. Thank God for work. Some people think, well, work came because of the fall. No, 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 no. Work was there before the fall. As I said, Genesis 2.15, God told him to work the garden, right? So, Work is of spiritual origin because God worked. Work is a divine attribute. Let me explain. Animals put to task, but they don't choose their task. You say, well, uh, you know, uh, an ox was made to work. I mean, God, uh, no, no, an ox didn't choose his work. We, we designed, we desired, we designed, we chose the task for it. We said, oh, you're strong enough, you'll pull a plow. You're strong enough, I'll use you to do this. The animal didn't choose its task. Man chose its task. So uh, it's a divine attribute. So it's not in animals. Although there's creation in animals, but the task that they have, they didn't pick it. We picked it for them in the sense that we use them for different things. But the attribute for um, work is is a spiritual attribute it's in man mankind only work is god-given responsibility work activates potential work releases our potential work is the exercising of your gifts and talents that's what it's for that's how you get them out that's how you use them work is the exercising of your gifts and talents work gives reality and tangibility to vision. Hey, you can imagine it, but the only way to get that imagination into reality is to work. It's the only way you can do it. You've got to put the effort in to make that happen. Work is for the fulfillment of your purpose. Work, vision, sorry, purpose, 
vision, planning, work. That's how you get it out. That's how you get it out. So work is for the fulfillment of purpose. Work is the key to your progress, productivity, and the fulfillment of life. Work is not a job. Work is not a job. There's a difference. A job may in some way express your work. Hey, you may be in a job right now, and you know what? Some of those talents, graces, and gifts that God put in you are being developed, honed, and experienced in the job you're in. But your work and your job are two different things. Your work is the getting out of, out of the inside of you what is your purpose. A job is just um, part of the destiny of life that hones maybe, might get you to exercise and develop the work that is in you, but it's a different thing. And I'll show you why. A job may be in some way express your work. A job can be changed or terminated, but your work does not. Does that make sense? You can change your jobs, but God's not going to change your purpose. And the work to get that out doesn't change. You may change jobs, but, but the work doesn't change. Your work is the same. To get out of you what is in you requires work, not a job. That job may hone your work skills. It may hone your talents, graces, and giftings. But you can go get another job. And jobs may change, but your work won't because it's permanent. All right? So a job can be changed or terminated, but your work does not. A job is to make a living. Your work is your reason for living. They're different. They're different. You get a job to make a living, for sustenance, or, or, or to provide, and, and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't define you. The job you're in does not define you. God defines you, and the work and the giftings and the graces that are you define you, not the job you're in. You say, well, I work in this parent, but you know what? I have greater passions and desires to do more. Absolutely. Your job doesn't define you. It may reveal some of your outworkings, but there's a difference between them. So a job is to make a living. Your work is your reason for living. A job is for you. Your work is for the glory of God. They're different. A job can be retired from, but your work it's permanent. Until you finish what your purpose is, you're not finished. So I'm retired, I'm done. No, you're not. Well, I'm 65, I got a watch and a handshake. Well, you better get up off your behind and get on with your purpose of life because you have to distinguish between purpose and job. Your job may have finished and they may be finished with you, but God ain't finished with you until you achieve the purpose and hit the mark of the high call that's in Christ for your life. And there is potential to do it. Whereas everybody tell you, you need to wind down now and you're finished. You are not finished. You are not finished. You may have learned a lot of things up until 65. Now you need to put them into practice. You're smarter than you were when you were 45. Wiser than you were when you were 25. For goodness sake, don't, after going through all of that destiny of life, all of that journey to learn and hone the skill sets and get the character that you have, don't let them put you out the pasture at 65 because they're finished with your job. Know the difference between your job and your work. All right. Here's what Jesus said. He, 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 he as I said, when you read it, it's all over the place, but as I say, sometimes you read over and you just, you, you miss it. No man can serve two masters. Now Jesus is speaking here. And I, I put arrows up there to the two masters. One of the masters of your life is purpose. The other master of your life is want. You can live your life for want. I want this, I want that, I want to live here, I want to drive that, I want to go here, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. I want more money, want more happiness, want more peace, want more whatever. 
So you can live your life for two reasons. You can live your life for purpose or you can live your life for want. And he, just, he says this. He says, no man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to one of them and despise the other. And then he, he names the two of them. You cannot serve God, which is purpose, or money, which is just want. It's just the worldly version of a job. And then he goes on to define it even more. He says, look, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? Nor yet for your body or what you shall put on. Your life is more than meat and your body is more than clothes. He said, come on, stop living for want and start living for purpose. Stop living for you and start living for the potential that God give you existence. You still with me? And he's trying to show you the difference. Then he goes on and he says, oh, I put this in another version, I'm sorry. No man can serve the two masters. He'd hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one, despise it. You cannot serve God. And then I just put down here in this little bracket, purpose and work or deployment or be enslaved to money. And I put job and want and employment. Is there a difference between deployment and employment? Yes. There's a big difference. Employment is to serve the needs of your want. Deployment is to fulfill the requirements of your purpose. God says, I know you have that need over there, that you have things you need to get and things to do. I understand where you live, but I really want you to live for deployment, not employment. Do I need to be employed? In the world we live right now, in order to get sustenance to do what you need to do, yes, we do need employment. But don't mix up employment with deployment, because they're different things. Deployment is attached to giving of yourself to something. Employment is working to get something for yourself. You all with me? They're different. And Jesus is trying to show the difference here. You gotta live for one or the other. All right? Pardon? Which comes first? Well, you decide that. You decide what you're gonna live for. He knows that you need bread to put on the table and clothes on your back and to pay the rent. And he knows, because that's the world we're living in. But what he's saying is most of the people in the world live for a job. He says, I understand you need that and you need a job, but don't let the job be the focus of your life. Let purpose be the focus of your life. And I can get a job to you and resources to you a million different ways. But let purpose be the desire of your life, not want. Let me read on. I'm, I'm in verse 25. Let me read for another version here. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life whether you have enough. Again, this is a job and employment. Do I have enough? Do I have enough? Do I have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear? He said, do you think that I put you here in life and that your life is all about food and your body's all about clothes? You think that's what, you think that was the purpose for which I put you on the planet? That you would spend your whole life worrying about that sort of stuff? He said, look at the birds. They, they don't plant or harvest, store in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you much more valuable to him than they are? Then in verse 32, he says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek first the kingdom above all else. Live righteously. And he'll give you everything you need. He'll get it to you. But you've got to make your mind up. Do you live for purpose or do you live for a job? Yes, you have a job. There's nothing wrong. Thank God for the job that you have. And use it and develop from it and, and influence it and be a light in it and lead people to Christ through it and let your light shine wherever God has you to be and develop the character and the attributes and, and the skill sets and the graces and the compassions and the mercies and the understanding and be a reflection of the love of God wherever you're at. 
He said, I'd rather have a job over there where I get more. No, 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 you're living for the wrong reason. Understand that God has you somewhere that you need to be because it's you. We're not competing with each other for jobs. We're complementing each other for purpose by fulfilling ours and being content where we're at. Does that make sense? All right. Your job is what you do. Your work manifests who you are. That's the difference. That's the difference. Your value to life is your work. Your gift and talents are manifested by your work. Your value to life is your work. That's the value of you. Is to get out of you what God put in you. The purpose of you. Your gifts and talents are manifest by your work. Let me do this. Just a few more slides and we close. Employ or deploy. I just need to show you the difference. Employ or deploy. There is a difference. All right. Here's the difference. To employ means to hire somebody for money. That's what employing means. That's what a job is. To deploy is to place resources that are already existing to local strategic purpose. Employment is to hire somebody for money. To deploy is to release something that already exists in a certain area for a certain reason. They're different. We are employed. These are little sentences, just to try and help you grasp. So I put paid to, so you'll, you'll grasp what I'm talking about. We are employing more people as the existing employees have already been deployed onto different projects. He uses two different words. We are hiring somebody for money because we let other people go to release what they have somewhere else. One is, one is a, a, a paying somebody to get something from them. The other one is to deploy, is to release them to do what they already have. We want to employ your own, our own resources for this work rather than developing their resources. Or deploying, should I say, their resources. The troops who are, were recently employed were deployed in the easiest location to make them comfortable. So what am I trying to show you? They're, they're different. Employment means that you're giving somebody something that they want from you um, and they're paying you for that. And it may be well part of your gift and talents and graces that they see and think, I'll hire that. And if you do it for that reason, then, then really you're just working for a job. But if you live life with the sense of deployment, then you're taking what's already in you, not just what they're hiring, but what is in you, and you're giving that away. You're not paying you for it. They may be paying you because they want something from you, but your deployment is the giving of your purpose. Employment means somebody else controls your gift or talent for a specific end. So they see a talent or a grace, it's part of your purpose, and they think, he is brilliant, I'm going to, I'll, I'll employ him. Great with numbers, great with people, great with whatever. Make a great doctor, great nurse, make a great, they see a talent or a grace. So they employ somebody, means that they control the gift or talent for a specific end. Deployment means that you release what is on the inside of yourself according to purpose. So I, I can, you can employ me and I can take a job. I thank God for Bible Optics and I have a job and I thank God for that. It helps me to meet my needs and it helps me to sustain what I'm doing and be where I'm at to continue to do what I'm doing. But my drive in life is my deployment, not my employment. I live for what I do. I don't live for a salary. I get a salary for what I do and I'm very grateful and thankful for it. You know, I really am. It's, it's wonderful. But my life is for deployment, not employment. And there is a difference. So, being confident of this very thing, that he that began this good work. You know, God's trying to get out of you what's in you. And he's working with you to do that. We'll perform it until the day you meet Jesus. 
I have a bunch of more scriptures, but I never get to them. But any questions on that? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, and, and there were, uh, were verses I'm going to use. When you serve, you serve as unto the Lord. And now let me give you a quick example. Um, in, in between uh, stepping away from pastoring to here, when we're going through the transition of working with, uh, to get our, our uh, credentials and green, green cards and whatever to come here, uh, I, I went and took employment which wasn't native to what I was doing for the last 30 years. Lucy likewise, because uh, we, we still, you know, we, we had a salary in church, but when, when we, in, in transition, I didn't have that salary, so I needed to go work, or I needed to go get a job. But here's the thing about the job, both for me and for Lucy. In that job, I, I pastored everybody in the, in the factory. I, I counseled the whole lot. I'd go to work at night, and I'd have the, the manager coming over and say, can I talk to you for a bit? I'd say, yeah, sure. I, you know, this is going on, and that's going on, and I was wondering about this. And I ended up, I was supposed to be working, or should I say, I, I employed to do something, and I would spend, and I, you know, Lucy, tell me, I, I counseled every one of those guys, night after night, for hours. I remember when, when I got married first, before I was even in the ministry, and I remember I was working in a, on a work scheme, an employment scheme in, in a place, and we were in there making all sorts of stuff. We were welding and doing stuff, sort of keep us off unemployment, basically. And I got in there and got talking to all the, the, the guys who were training us in electronics, training us in welding and whatever, but my gift just kept coming out no matter what i did i was working with or i had a job with everybody else but my talents and graces would just would just keep coming to the fore and there were times when we had a lot of difficult individuals there that were unemployed and took on this scheme or this course and they had issues and problems of life whether it was you know a, a addictions or whatever and I, instead of me making the stuff you know we were welding and stuff learning to weld and do you know TIG welding and MIG welding and whatever, these guys would come to me for counsel, for chat, to talk. And the guys who were supervising the departments we were in, they never asked me to do anything. They wanted me to talk to the guys because they felt that the guys were getting more from what I was telling them than the welding course that they were on or the, the electronics course were on. So the guys used to leave me to myself. And so I'd find myself in a room where two or three guys would be sitting on the floor with me, talking to me about addiction, or talking to me about God, or talking to me about problems that they're having. And I used to watch the supervisors walk past and go, <laughs> and leave me there. And at that time, and I was a lot younger as a Christian, I used to take little gospel tracts. And I used to go into the toilets in, in the men's bathroom in the morning, and there was about 20 toilets there, cisterns, and, on the, and I used to go in there, and I'd put a different variety every day. I'd put a different one on the thing. It came to a place where the janitor used to come to me in the morning and say, give them to me, I'll take them. And the janitor was putting them out in the men's and in the ladies' toilets. And sometimes they'd come in, and some of the guys maybe that were used in the restroom would grab, say, oh, that Christian fella, and they'd throw them in the toilet, or they'd throw them on the floor, and he'd come in, and he'd fix them, and he'd straighten them out, and he'd put them back on, or he'd come to me and say, have you got any more of them? He says, some of those guys went and did what they did. Because I couldn't stop working, even though I was in my job. You just can't help yourself. It's just what your work is. But I, but I did jobs, but in my job, my work of my purpose kept coming out. Does that make sense? And every one of those jobs, I needed to be where I was to learn what I was to do what I did. And I thank God for it. But my working is still in process, still in progress. This is just another job in the process. 
So be encouraged. Is that all right for everybody? All right. You okay? Everybody? All right. Somebody want to close this out in prayer? Were you going to ask something? I'd like to see the rest of the scriptures. <laughs> And I'll run through them real quickly for you. There you go. Philippians 2.12. It's God that's working in you. Work out your salvation. That means that there's more to your life now than just the job you're in. You've got to work out what's on the inside of you. For it's God that's working in you. That's what he does. That's what he's doing. Or a verse here in, in 2 Corinthians 6.1. It says, we then as workers together with God. This is what you do with God. You don't get a job with God. You work with God. God's working in you and through you, and you're working out your salvation. Ephesians 2 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus onto good works. That's not just the physical goodness that you do, but it's the outworking of the purpose for you. And you do that by working it out. Hebrews 13.2 says, A that he would make you perfect in every good work to do his will and again working in you god's work in us is to work through us that's not a job that is your giftings graces and potential it's the purpose for your life god's very much in it with you when you find out what it was